Great. Well, welcome everybody for joining us. Uh, welcome to a fearlessly curious webinar presented by Packback. Uh, we are joined by two uh, very special guests today. Uh, we have Dr. Kathleen or Cat West from University of North Carolina, Charlotte, and uh, Dr. Kasten uh, Anderson Carpenter of Michigan State University. Uh, they are both going to be sharing tips. Um, on both using technology and positive reinforcement uh, to achieve critical thinking and engagement in the classroom. And so we have a, a very fun segment today that, uh, that we'll be getting into here. So the agenda for today, and um, we'll, be, we'll be keeping within 60 minutes. Um, a quick introduction, my name is Mike Shannon. I'm our CEO here at Packback. Uh, really honored to uh, uh, host our amazing presenters and all of you audience uh, attendees. Um, I'll give a little bit of an introduction to how we're hosting, and then we'll, we'll get into you know, really the core. So uh, sharing uh, ed tech tips, uh, with Dr. Kathleen West and Dr. Kasten Anderson Cooper, uh, sorry, Carpenter. Um, and then we'll have an open question and answer uh, at the end of, of the segment here. So thanks all uh, for joining. And um, I'll go ahead and, and give a little bit of, uh, of a background uh, before we introduce our presenters here. So as an introduction to Packback, um, Packback, uh, our purpose statement here is to exist, we exist to awaken and fuel the lifelong curiosity in every student. Uh, we're a student founded startup company. We uh, came out of Illinois State University uh, just close to a decade ago uh, now, and we were student uh, founders. We've, we've now built up um, you know, a fairly, fairly large team here in Chicago. And in order to awaken and fuel the lifelong curiosity in every student, uh, what we build and provide is an intelligent discussion platform that we call Packback Questions that helps to measure and improve soft skills um, such as curiosity and critical thinking in students. So we're a platform uh, that makes it very manageable uh, to facilitate you know, highly engaged discussions um, in any scale from the 10 student uh, graduate student course up to the thousand plus student you know, online and lecture halls. Uh, really helping make discussion manageable, giving students uh, some of the additional coaching and um, you know curation around the curiosity within the subject matter. So, um, if anybody's interested in pack back afterwards, um, there is a few links that you can reach out to. But this webinar um, is really something that we're facilitating, not as pack back specific, but more around some of uh, of the tactics um, period that the experts we're able to work with are, are using with with that tech. So without further ado, that's our Packback introduction. I am super honored uh, to introduce our presenters. So I will take myself off video, um, introducing Dr. Kathleen um, Kat West. Uh, Dr. West is um, actually uh, joining us here from University of, um, yeah, UNC Charlotte, as, as we said. Uh, she earned her bachelor's degree in psychology in 2003 from Clemson University and a PhD in the neurosciences in 2008 from the Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, quite a background there. She then went on to do a postdoctoral fellowship in the biochemistry department at the Medical University of South Carolina. And currently, Dr. West is the undergraduate coordinator in the Department of Psychological Science at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, where she teaches a variety of online, hybrid, and traditional classes, all kinds of expertise and experience there. We're excited to learn from you. Please take it away, Dr. Cat West. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I had them add a little bit of the information here about myself, um, including all the different types of things that I've taught, hopefully to encourage you, no matter what discipline that you are in, um, that this platform can still work for you and that all the tips and tricks and things that I'm going to talk about today are still applicable because I've taught all over the range. Um, currently, I'm in the psychology department, but I've taught biology, I've taught math. Um, so again, a lot of these tips and tricks can work no matter uh, where you are. So one of the things that I think is really important um, in just in general for every student at any level and in any department is working on their critical thinking skills and something that I like to call discipline specific communication. So if they're in a psychology class using the terms, the technology, the language that psychologists would use to communicate about what they're talking about. 
But one of the things that I've learned uh, in the past several years is there's a number of challenges and you've probably experienced most, if not all of these, um, with our group of students. So at least at my university, there's been an issue with increasing class size. And as you have an increase in class size, you have a, a kind of limitations on what you can and can't do with the students. And it, it can make things a little more challenging. Um, there's also been an increased demand for online classes um, for a variety of reasons, uh, just access to campus. Students are busy. We have a lot of non-traditional students that are working full time, so they need the online courses. Um, with that being said, the, the third point here is just that we do, at least here at UNC Charlotte, have a lot of mixed student population. We have the traditional 18 year old straight out of high school, but then we also have non-traditional students that are coming to us after being in the military or after a career or wanting a degree or a second degree or wanting to change paths in life. So we kind of have to meet our students where they are and still try to provide the same kind of foundation. At least I try to provide this foundation of the ability to be um, able to critically think about whatever topic we're going over is going to help you no matter where you are and where you started from. Another issue that's interesting that I have found recently is that most students, my younger students especially, my more traditional students are really good at using technology, but with some really unique limitations. Um, for example, they really communicate well using technology as long as they can do so in 280 characters or less. Um, if you require them to do more than that, it gets a little complicated. And again, it's all just the skills that they've learned. Um, another interesting feature is that likes and followers are very important to them. It validates what they're saying instead of actually being what they're saying being valid, if that makes any sense. And so again, that's one of the things that I try to work on in this idea of when I'm teaching them is that, you know, if you're using critical thinking skills, those other things don't matter. You communicated what's important. Um, Another thing, and this relates to the little joke that's on the side there, is that students aren't used to having to think and they aren't used to having to do problem solving. Um, if they can't Google it, they get frustrated very, very quickly. And that's the little duck that's over here. Um, the duck was asked to find something. And as you can see, there is it. Um, and immediately the duck gets frustrated. Um, again, sorry, I over explained the joke there, but that's how a lot of our students are today is that they they very, very quickly get frustrated. And so that's another thing you're dealing with is that anxiety that the student has and trying to talk them down from that. And kind of related to all of this social media and things that students have been engaged in for as long as they can remember, they've grown up believing that opinions are as good as or the same thing as facts. Um, so for example, if you were having a conversation with somebody about whether or not um, they should spank their child as a form of discipline. You're going to have somebody that says, I was spanked as a child and I turned out fine, so spanking is fine. And you're going to have someone else that says, I was not spanked as a child and I turned out fine, so not spanking is the way to go. And in those cases, what I try to explain to the student is, is neither of those was actually based on actual science. Both of those were opinions and opinions are okay, but in my particular class, we need to actually base it on actual science. And so we need to look deep into what does the actual science say and then use that to inform what we think about this topic. So some things that I'm gonna to try to talk to you about today is how I actually get students to do them to practice their critical thinking skills. Um, I in no way think that I um, get them to do it entirely, but I do hope that I'm getting them to practice throughout the semester. And related to that, I hopefully am also getting them to practice discipline-specific communication. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I use the Packback technology um, to do this. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I use positive reinforcement as well. And then I'm hopefully going to end my little segment here by talking about how even though a lot of my examples are going to be psychology based, you can do this in just about any type of class, no matter the discipline size or format. Um, a little bit about me because this is going to relate to why I think this is so important. Um, anytime I apply for a job or am I just giving a, a talk about my teaching philosophy, I always use this uh, simple little childhood game that I played called Blockhead. The point of the game is to build a tower. You take turns with whoever's there and you put one piece on the tower at a time and you want to not be the person to knock it over. So if you put a piece on it, it falls over, you lose and you start over. But I say what's really interesting about this is I use this 
is an analogy for a person's education and a person's career. And I say, you know, it really is going to depend what you put as that bottom block as to what you can then be able to stack on top and where you're able to go with it. You know, if you have just a very simple or if you're able to branch out or if you're able to get really high. So what I always ask students or what I always say um, to anybody that I'm speaking with is, you know, if you were going to create a tower and you were going to say, OK, this base level needs to be their ability to critical think about any subject, not just psychology, any subject that they're thinking about, what would be the best block? Um, and so you can see here, I'm going to let you guys say, what would you pick? Hopefully you saw the colors before I brought the poll up here. Um, but I'll let you guys vote really quick. What would you say? What would you rather have as the base of your foundation, the very small little orange one, or one of the bigger pieces like the yellow block that was a whole huge size like this, red was somewhere in the middle, blue was somewhere in the middle. You know, give you a few more seconds to vote again. Sorry if you didn't see the pieces ahead of time. All right, so basically what we decided is that somewhere between one of these blue pieces or one of these yellow pieces is gonna be the best. And I absolutely agree. You definitely wouldn't wanna use this tiny little orange piece. There's not nearly a steady enough base there. And again, the whole analogy here is just that the more you give them, the more they can critically think about a wide range of subjects would be one of these more sturdier blocks. And so that's what I'm always striving to do with my students is to give them that foundation so that no matter where they go, career-wise, education-wise, they're gonna have that foundation and be able to talk about and understand any particular subject. Sorry if you didn't get to see the blocks in time. So here's some of the language that I actually use when I'm speaking to my students, either on, on syllabus or just in their course goals. I tried to, to numb this down a little bit so that it wasn't psychology specific, so that if you wanted to borrow any of this language, you would absolutely be able to do so. So I tell students that one of the things that we're going to do in class during the semester is to apply and connect concepts that are real life situations. In other words, we're gonna look at what we're talking about and we're gonna see if we can connect it with real life conditions and situations. Students really find this entertaining, they find it fascinating, and it really does help them to say, okay, this is why this is important and this is something that I can understand. And at the same time, we're also gonna practice critical thinking and evaluating arguments um, in this case about how the brain works, but you can insert your discipline specific idea there. So we're gonna practice this. It's okay if you're not very good at it at first, I'm gonna teach you how to work on critical thinking and evaluating arguments. Something that I might say in my syllabus, for example, and this is where I'm gonna get a little bit pack pack specific here, is that we are going to work on our ability to think critically and scientifically, one, because it's important to the field, but also because they're gonna need this, these particular skills throughout their life and that we're going to use plat Packback Questions platform to do so. Um, and that last part there is that my goal for students is to get comfortable expressing a scientific opinion and then justifying or supporting that opinion with actual scientific data. So to do this, again, we participate in Packback every week. I have my students logging onto the platform. They will ask questions. They will answer questions. Um, and I always find that it's best if I start the semester off with some sample seeded questions. I kind of give them right from the bat some exact type of questions, one that I want them to be asking, but two that if they answer correctly, forces them to use critical thinking skills. So I'll give you a few examples that you can hopefully adapt in your own courses. The first type of question there is where I'm gonna take two terms or two concepts that they've learned in the class and I'm just gonna ask them to compare it in some way. So in this case, um, I ask them to defend their choice and again by using that language that's going to encourage them to back up what they're saying and hopefully you will encourage throughout the semester to back it up with science as opposed to with opinion but would it be worse to have no sensory neurons or no motor neurons and again it doesn't matter if you exactly understand what those are but the students would have been taught that in class so I take those two competing terms no right or wrong answer, but they have to pick one and defend it. And again, by having them practice that skill of picking one and defending it, they very quickly get really good at backing it up with specific facts that they've hopefully learned from your lecture or from the book. Um, two other types of seeded questions that work really well are real life examples. So for example, um, I'm gonna use the one over on the right side of your screen first. I'm just comparing two real life examples and again, having them defend their choice. So I give them two particular characters from psychology classic literature. One of them is patient HM who could no longer make long-term memories. And another is Dr. John Nash, who was a brilliant mathematician but suffered from schizophrenia. And again, I have them defend their choice. If you had to live life as one of these two characters, 
characters, which would you choose and why? Um, and you could do this with anybody in your discipline. If you had to be studying the research of this person or this person, which would you choose and why? So there's a lot of ways that you can do that. But again, it's a little more real life for them because they have to put themselves into those um, particular roles and say, not just what did they do, but why would I enjoy doing this myself? And then the last thing is very similar, again, a real life example, but now I'm having them connect it to a peer reviewed article and I'm demonstrating how to use a peer reviewed article to back up their opinion. So in this case, I linked them to an article that came out a while back about uh, traumatic brain injury and football players. And I just had them defend, should we get rid of football? Should people allow, be allowed to play football? But again, back it up with evidence from this article, as opposed to just, I love football, don't get rid of it. So again, what I try to do with my students is to give them some example questions that they can hopefully model after but also by answering them, practice their critical thinking skills. So the very first semester I used Packback felt a lot like this. Um, and I only bring this up to say what I really started and what I really learned is that I don't need to stress so much, right? So what I did the very first semester is I went through everything that my students wrote. I read every single post. I tried to respond to every single conversation. I tried to give all of this feedback and detailed stuff and I nitpicked. And what I realized is that students were 10 conversations ahead of me. They were already talking about something else within the platform and weren't necessarily paying attention to every single little detail that I was putting in there. So again, I was way overdoing it and not taking advantage of the tools that Packback had to offer. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna try to encourage you to do today is to not stress so much about that, but use some of the tips and tricks to make it much more effective and much easier for you. So the biggest trick that I have is what I call my positive reinforcement focus. So instead of responding to every single little post, what I really try to do now is to highlight the things that are really good and to emphasize the students that have done something really well so that hopefully other students will imitate that style. And I do that using the tools right within Packback. So here's a question that a student asked that I thought was a really good question. So what I did is I clicked the praise button. Right. And I, I gave the students some feedback, and it's a little hard to read down there, but I gave them feedback about what I thought was so good about this question. And in this particular case, I loved that it was an open-ended question. The student had apparently taken a look at my seated questions and came up with a very good question of their own that was a very similar style. So I said, great job challenging your classmates to think about this topic. And what I found is that by doing this, by highlighting these really good ones, and it can be for whatever reason, Great job connecting chapter six and chapter eight. Really great question. I'm not sure science knows this. Let's hypothesize. Whatever it is, but by giving a lot of praise, which not only does the student see, but the entire class can see because it will turn the post green, the students are then going to go and focus on the ones that, hey, Professor West said this was good. Let me go find out why. Professor says West said this one was good. Let me go find out why. That I get a lot more students imitating and copying those really good examples, which is, again, just a really great way to learn how to do these skills. Similarly, I also love to give coaching. Now, coaching is also really a neat feature of Packback because it's just between me and the student. So in this particular case, the student has asked a question here, and it's a good question. It's just not quite related to our class material. So it's not something I need to delete. It's not something that violated any sort of um, integrity or anything like that, but I want to encourage them to go one step further. So again, I'm going to use this coaching feature to say, okay, um, I want you to go back and look at this question. See if you can incorporate, in this case, it was a biopsychology class. See if you can incorporate a little bit more of the biology. See if you can think about the brain regions involved or the hormone systems involved or the neurotransmitter systems involved. So in other words, see if you can rework your question. And what I have found is that most students that I'll give this coaching to will actually go back and fix their question. And again, hopefully get a lot more meaningful experience out of their post. So now, now that I've started using this positive reinforcement model, this is a lot more what my teaching is like, at least it's what it feels like. I'm no longer fighting off um, a lot of things. I'm no longer stressing myself out. I feel much more in control and I really feel like my students are getting a much better experience and they really are doing a lot more to work on their critical thinking skills. So what does this mean for you? Well, what I really hope you take away too is that that positive reinforcement model works, but that you can use this particular platform and that particular positive for reinforcement model in any sort of classroom. I've used it in an online class. I've used it in traditional face-to-face -face classes, and I'll be doing that again in the spring. Um, so, but again, there's are a few differences that I wanted to make you aware of. So for example, in an online class, you're probably going to need to do a little more praising and coaching because you don't get to see the students face-to-face. 
Um, so you don't get to have some of those in-class moments. Um, I also have found that it works really well to highlight really good posts. So I will praise it and then I will also copy it and post it into the learning management system as an announcement. And just one more time reiterating, this was really good. Kudos to the student. Everybody should try to copy this style. So it's just another way to kind of give them an extra impact of the good positive things that I want them to keep doing. In a traditional face-to-face -face class, I love to start every class with pack back. So I will bring up somebody's question or somebody's answer that was particularly good. I will actually give them kudos. So I'll go say, hey, where is Wonder Woman? As you can see here from my learner leaderboard, Wonder Woman will raise her hand and I'll say, kudos, this is a really great question. Let's talk about why it was so good. And you can give them that immediate feedback right there and say, okay, tonight when you go home, see if you can think of a question that's the style or see if you can respond to a question using this exact format and it works really well. And then other times students will ask spontaneous questions in class and sometimes those are the best questions but you don't really have time to answer them and so one of my great tricks is i actually encourage the student to use that as their pack back question i'll say you know what that's a phenomenal question right now either write it down or go ahead and get out your phone make that your pack back question go ahead and just make that your pack back question for the week and first of all they get all excited because they're like yay i did my pack back assignment but Right. Everybody heard me praise it and they're all going to go look for that question. And they're probably going to respond to it after class. So it's a really way to keep, great way to keep students involved. If you're wondering how I find which questions to ask, um, no, I don't sit at my computer all day, every day scanning all these questions. Um, sometimes I only have just a few seconds to check for things right before a class. And that's why I have this learner leaderboard here. This is where if you needed to in a pinch and you haven't had a lot of time to review yet before class, you could find probably find a good question or a good answer. Um, the learner leaderboard is based off the artificial intelligence that Packback uses to score students as far as the length of their posts, the quality of their posts, whether or not they've included sources. So again, it's a really quick way I can click on any one of my top four leaders here, Captain America, Jean Grey, any of them, and probably quickly find a question that I can then use in class. I don't always do this, but again, this is one of my tricks for if you're in a pinch. And then some things that you can do um, everywhere. I always tell students that good questions might show up on a quiz or an exam, and I've absolutely done that. I also encourage them to use Packback when they're studying. So I say, if you can't answer a Packback question in five minutes or less, you're probably not ready for the exam as far as time goes. So you should practice more. And so I'll see a flurry of Packback questions getting answered um, in the weeks before an exam. And then a the last trick that I've just started using, which I really, really love, um, is I've I was worried a little bit about misinformation um, being presented in the Packback. Uh, platform. And so what I've done is I started offering just a standard extra credit where if a student finds a, something that has been posted in Packback that is incorrect, that has not already been corrected, because a lot of times within a conversation, they'll correct themselves. But if they find something that's incorrect that has not been corrected, they can take a screenshot and email it to me and I will give them one extra credit point. This is amazing for several reasons. First of all, they're going to read extra questions because they want extra credit and they don't realize that I'm forcing them to study by looking for things that are wrong. So I'm forcing them to study. I'm also reinforcing again, hopefully, all right, that critical thinking and understanding of the topic. But also, I don't have to then spend my time looking for things that are wrong because they're going to go and find it for me. And I can tell you that this semester I've given out two extra credit points. So it's not like this is happening a lot, but I know that they're looking for it. Um, it's pretty interesting and it works pretty well. So again, hopefully you can see that a lot of the things that I do aren't necessarily psychology specific and hopefully you could apply them to your class, to your discipline. Um, again, positive reinforcement is really, really effective. Telling them what was good and why it was good and then encouraging them to go and do it again works very, very well. Definitely has improved critical thinking skills and has also at the same time improved discipline specific communication within my students. Um, so hopefully you've gotten a little something out of my talk and I appreciate your time. Great, well, Dr. Cat West, thank you so much for sharing all of that. And um, it'll be fun to uh, chop this up into to dialogue in a few minutes here. Our next presenter here, um, go ahead and, and flip slides, is Dr. Kasten Anderson Carpenter. Uh, Dr. Kasten or Cass Anderson Carpenter earned a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in experimental psychology and applied behavioral analysis uh, from McNeese uh, State University and then went on to earn a master's degree in public health and a PhD in behavioral psychology from the University of Kansas. Now, after earning his PhD, he completed a postdoctoral fellowship in addiction health services research at UCLA, 
Uh, currently, Dr. Anderson Carpenter is an assistant professor of psychology at Michigan State University in the ecological uh, slash community psych psychology program. He teaches both undergraduate and graduate courses in areas such as community psychology, health psychology, and research methods. That is a whole lot uh, and a, a long, interesting academic uh, journey. We are so honored to have you uh, online today. Please take it away, uh, Dr. Anderson Carpenter. Thank you. Yes, I've been, I'm a recovering academic nomad. Um, as you can see from my background, um, I've taught, um, I've, I've been exposed to a lot of different areas, um, and I bring the experiences that I've learned as a longtime student into the classroom, really drawing from people that I've seen who have been effective teachers, my own experiences as an undergraduate and graduate student. And so when I teach, I like to use Bloom's taxonomy as a way to guide my teaching. And as an undergraduate student, and even as a graduate student um, in some cases, I've had exams and courses where a lot of the material was at the remembering and understanding levels. And so what I try to do in my undergraduate courses, especially, is to take them all the way through creation. Because it's important in today's world that people understand not only how not only that they remember information and be able to explain ideas and concepts, but they also have to be able to apply information from one topic to another. Um, they have to be able to analyze, be able to draw connections. And that's something that I really stress in all my classes. They have to also be able to evaluate information. These days in the age, in the information age, we get so much information thrown at us. We're inundated. And not all of it is good information. Not all of it is sound. Not all of it is based on evidence. And so one of the things I do in my courses is to help students to filter out solid or valid information. And then finally, I encourage students to produce something, to create um, new models, new paradigms, new frameworks, et cetera. And I actually have an example of that. Now, even though I teach primarily psychology courses and have taught psychology courses primarily, my students come from all majors. I have many kinesiology students, nutrition, biology pre-med, sociology, anthropology, um, supply chain management. So the skills that I teach my students um, they are applicable to all majors. And so even the examples that I use in class, I try to make them where students from any major can see how the material would apply in their career or even in their life. Um, I do have a poll question for you all. Um, what is the biggest challenge that you have faced in keeping students engaged in the classroom? And I give you a few moments to, to think about it and respond. Okay, so it seems a kind of, sort of split between students contributing to the classroom. Well, mainly students contributing to the classroom discussion. Um, some people have noted that social media distractions have become our one of the biggest challenges. Um, I will say as an instructor and as a student, those are the two big things for me. Um, when I was a student, I sat by the door. Um, I, I did well in, in my classes, but I would sit by the door, would not engage. Um, as an instructor, I learned that social media was a big, a, a big competition um, in terms of the social media being more reinforcing and more rewarding for students than the lectures. Um, I also had to realize that students process information differently. So not everyone is going to learn well if, you know, just from me standing in front of a lecture in front of a classroom and talking for an hour and a half, regardless of how comedic I might be. 
And I've given some Oscar worthy performances, I must say. Um, but you know, now there's Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat that are more reinforcing for students than sitting in the lecture hall. So I thought, okay, how can I bring, you know, technology into the classroom, have it be reinforcing and still give other ways for students to be able to process the information and to learn the information and remember it. And so those are the questions that made me really think, okay, let me try pack back. This seems like a way to accomplish all of my goals and address some of the challenges that I've experienced both as, you know, in my student days and now as an instructor. And so two things that I've learned um, and I would like to share with you all um, is that using technology effectively in the classroom can be a way to really increase student engagement both in and outside of the classroom. And using the reinforcers that Dr. Kat mentioned earlier can foster critical thinking and ultimately empower students to thrive. And the thriving is not just in my classroom, but also outside of my classroom. Long after my courses are finished, I want to see that students have, even if they've taken one thing and remember one thing from my classroom, that they're able to apply that, to apply the information throughout their lives and throughout their careers. So I'll show you how I create, I try to create conditions for students to excel because it's not enough for me as an instructor to say, okay, I want students to excel. It's incumbent upon me to create the conditions for students to be engaged and for students to excel. So what I do is use the technology in the classroom to support critical critical thinking and student engagement across Bloom's taxonomy. So yes, they, throughout all the course content that I have, I, you know, through the exams, it's more at the lower levels, but through pack back and other assignments and class activities, I try to get at more at the application analysis, evaluation and creation stages. And I also believe in presenting the course content in multiple formats. So they might see it in a class lecture, but a student might also uh, ask a follow-up question on PackBack, relating it to something they learned in another classroom. Um, I've had students relate material in community psychology to their engineering class. Um, I've had them present information that they about in, about current events that are going on. And then I take that information and then flip it into an exam question. And I'll show you how I, how I do that. So these are just exemplars of student-initiated discussion questions. So I teach two days a week. And so on Tuesdays, I give, it's lecture day. And on Thursdays, it's pack back day. And so the way I use pack back in my classrooms is that I have students submit their pack back questions by Wednesday evening. And so they will have had to have already read the material and or have come to class, preferably both. And then Thursdays, what I'll do is, or I should say I select eight to 10 pack back questions from that week and bring those to class Thursday. And that is our discussion. So because my student, the student, the classrooms that I, I should say the classes I teach, tend to be anywhere from 94 to 250 students or more, I don't require them to ask and answer a question for two reasons. One, I found that it's really cumbersome on them in the context of everything else they have to do in their other courses. And two, it's a lot for me and my TAs to get through. It's just impossible for us to do that every week. So I tell them they can respond to a question or ask a question or post a question on pack back, but not both. And the students were really like that. They have told me that it's not cumbersome, that, and it's, they find it pretty fun. And so one of the questions was looking at the publish or perish culture that's pretty common in, in academia. And so one student said that, you know, with this, this pressure to publish, and doing work with communities, regardless of 
whatever your discipline is, how can, you know, that can sometimes lead to ethical violations, you know, causing harm to the communities we work with. And so how could a research ethics violation actually affect the community that we're studying or that we're working with? Another student asked, you know, does psychology by nature hinder the diversity of opinions and the knowledge that's accepted as fact? So it's really getting getting to the epistemology and the philosophies that inform the work we do in psychology. We could ask these same questions in any field. You know, how does, you know, does the nature of our discipline hinder the diversity of opinions. So it's not just about psychology, it could be any discipline that we're in. Another student looked at or questioned why physicians still use body mass index or BMI in offices and medical records, even though the literature has shown that it is not an accurate measure of health or a comprehensive measure. So these are the kinds of questions my students ask between my community psych class and my health psych class. And again, these classes comprise students of all different majors across the university. And so how do I do the positive reinforcement? Because I'm not, I'm not going through every single post. Um, so students know that, um, that I'm going to bring the eight to 10 of the questions to classroom as a full class discussion every week. And so they they try to write questions that will garner a lot of responses so that, you know, chances are their question will be asked or brought to the forefront um, in the class discussion on Thursdays. And so a lot of the students, they link their questions either to prior lectures, to lectures in other class, in other their other courses, in other disciplines, or even to current events. And we do address controversial topics head on. For example, in the 2016 election, we addressed the election results and the implications of the results head on. Before any of the current events have happened, the day after the election, we talked about it. Um, things that are going on internationally, we talk about those things and how they might impact the communities they're working in or the communities that those issues are happening to not just from a psychological perspective, but we look at it from multiple disciplines. And so thoughtful and challenging responses or even questions that come out of the pack back discussions that happen in class, those questions and responses get my famous high five. I will run up and down the room and I will give them a high five. And so, and I don't give them out often. So students know that if they get a high five, they really nailed it. And with all of that, especially with my classrooms really addressing those controversial topics, the what we emphasize, and I try my best to create a culture of respect. So no matter what evidence is presented, no matter what the perspectives are that students share, I try to create a a community, a culture of respect so that we can all, we all have different worldviews, we all have different perspectives, but it's important for us to come to a place where we can talk about our different perspectives in a respectful way because the classroom environment is really a microcosm for society. And if we can't have these kinds of conversations in the classroom, then it's gonna be really challenging for us to have these conversations in society. And so again, as I, well, as I mentioned earlier, it's not enough for me to just present the material one time or in one format. For me to really make sure that students are understanding the material and to provide multiple opportunities for them to engage in the material, I take pack back questions and form them into exam questions. So not only are students cognizant that I can bring their pack back questions to the forefront in our classroom discussions on Thursdays, but they also know that their packed back questions may make their way to the exam. And they know it's actually in my syllabi that their packed back questions will form 10 to 20% of every exam they take. 
So they know that the work they're doing is being rewarded in a lot of ways. And it also gives them a great sense of agency in the classroom because they know that they're contributing substantially to the classroom and to the course content. So for example, one student asked, how can a researcher build trust in the community that they're working in and working with? And so I flipped it by asking which of the following actions can researchers take to build trust in the community? And so I used the answer choices based on their responses in the class. Another example was, um, given the negative effects of stress on diet, which, which techniques would be most effective in improving the unhealthy diet of a person who is living a stressful life? And, and why would those um, techniques be most effective? So then I took that and put it into a situation, a situational type question that was multiple choice. And so for the exam, they had to they had to know the differences between social skills training, self-reinforcement, cognitive behavior therapy, and all those techniques, and be able to distinguish which of the which of those techniques are being used in this in the scenario I posted for the exam. Whereas, whereas in the pack back question, it wasn't just a matter of knowing the difference, but they had to essentially def identify which would be most effective from their perspective and give a defense as to why. So that's how I use the, the how I use pack back as a way to inform the exam questions. And so again, it's not just about app applying or analyzing, it's also about creating. So in my honors, health psychology class, they're required to either create a model of health or create a model of health related to a particular condition. So one of my honor students actually created this framework of health, or I should say this framework for healthcare service utilization. And she integrated the ecological model. So looking at not just the individual level, but also looking at social conditions, physical surroundings and institutional um, determinants such as segregation, how insurance policies might take, might affect. So she used that within the psycho, the biopsychosocial model. So she blended the two of them and created her own model. And so, in the, in the assignment, not only did she create this exact model, but she also described the model and she had to do it and she had to do it concisely. I gave them two pages um, to give me a, a really quick snapshot of this is my model, this is why I chose the model, and they had to give citations. They had to provide evidence as to why they have the pathways set the way they are. And so this is one example from a student, um, and I would say about 30 or 40 students wanted to get honors credit, so they did this assignment. And the frameworks were amazing. Um, from every class that I've taught using PackBack, I've always walked away from that course having a new perspective on the way I teach these courses. And so I like to teach from a global and multicultural perspective, because when we talk about health or talk about things in the community, they affect not just those here at Michigan State University or those in psychology. The issues we talk about in my class affect people from all walks of life, from all cultures, backgrounds, worldviews, and all disciplines. So I really work to incorporate all of those perspectives into how I present information to students. And so just to recap, um, two takeaways that I would like for you to walk away with is one that using technology such as PackBack effectively in the classroom can increase student engagement. And what I like about PackBack is that you can get as involved with the platform as you want and as your schedule allows. And two, using technology and positive reinforcers, however you choose to deliver them, can foster critical thinking and then em further empower students to thrive in your classroom.
Very fascinating. Wow. Uh, you know, the, the passion that both of you have um, behind being purpose-driven educators is uh, it's really inspiring. Um, we'll, we'll pause for a minute. So, you know, open requests for any questions um, from our, our participants. Also, um, you know, PACBAC was, was referenced uh, within, you know, both of the, the recollections. Uh, we've got links up here if you'd like to, you know, request them kind of under the hood product demonstration. Um, go ahead. I, I've got a whole flurry of notes here and questions coming in. We've got 15 minutes. So I'd love to get both of, of you talking. Um, you know, maybe a question that we could kick off with. Um, and, and for one, Dr. Anderson Carpenter, one day, I think our team's going to compete for one of those high fives, uh, <laughs> if, we can, uh, if we can make it there. But let me ask, uh, let me ask a question, um, curating a few notes here. Uh, you, you both seem to talk about this connection um, to, to reality in the, the real world. Um, I know that as educators, right, you, you have to, you know, sort of walk this line between um, incorporating, you know, say current events and, you know, what's, what's happening in the news, connecting it to your subject matter, but also, um, you know, certainly, uh, Dr. West, you talked about misinformation that you, you have this task of getting through a certain amount of content, getting through what, say, your department expects um, to be covered from your, from your syllabus. How, how do both of you kind of navigate you know, interweaving current events and, um, you know, Dr. Anderson Carpenter, you talked about um, the day after the election, talking about, you know, the, the reality of that with students. How do you get through what you need to cover per, say, your department expectations while also interweaving current events? It's a, a fascinating um, kind of wave that you're both surfing. I'd love to, to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Um, so what I do is I integrate current events um, throughout the lecture. Um, I like to teach using examples um, because I found that when students, you know, just giving a description of a concept may not be enough. Um, a lot of students need to see, okay, how can I apply this? Give me an example of. So I use current events to illustrate examples of, um, of what we're of what I'm presenting. For example, today we talked about, or I should say this week, the topic in my community psychology class was about empowerment and citizen participation. And so I gave examples of what does it mean to have power over someone? What does integrative power look like? And in fact, one of the pack back questions we went over today was how can we use integrative power where people are coming together and sharing power and reducing the power differential, how can we use that integrative power to address food deserts in Michigan? So students who are in um, food nutritional sciences, they were able to you know, contribute a great deal to the conversation because this is kind of in their area. Um, we look, we even asked, you know, to what extent should communities of any kind be empowered? Are there communities that should not be empowered? That was an interesting debate, <laughs> but it was it was enlightening. Um, it, it was an enlightening debate, and so it really it it made students really think. Okay, we talk about empowerment. Yes, that's great, but are there under what in what conditions or under what circumstances should we not empower students or empower communities? Is that even an ethical thing to do? Um, so. If, if a conversation or if a topic really deserves a great deal of attention, I will, sh I will make the shift in, my, in, my, uh, in the syllabus. Um, I'll talk with the classroom, um, get gauge their, um, their um, responses. Um, the day after the election, actually, I was going to talk about implementation science. I completely suspended that lecture because I felt that with that with that current event, it would not have been appropriate for me to act like it didn't happen. And so a lot of it for me is really understanding where my students are and having that trust in that relationship and, you know, kind of reading the room in a sense or reading my classroom. I use a similar philosophy. Um... But a lot of my classes are, again, a lot more of that heavy content 
material. I teach what they call a brain and behavior class quite frequently. And I teach a physiological psychology class. And there's only so much you can do when you're having to get students to memorize neurotransmitters and brain regions and development. And, um, but what I really like to help them see is why we're asking them to memorize these things as psychologists. So that's kind of where I try to bring in the real life aspect. And I say, you know, yes, you do need to memorize it because you're going to be given a test on this. But for example, you might have an older parent that has a stroke. Well, you're going to need to know what's happening in the brain and what's gone wrong in that situation. So even though stroke wasn't really the subject matter, to talk about strokes, we had to understand neurotransmitter functioning. We had to understand cardiovascular functioning. We had to understand what potentially could have gone wrong in which part of the brain, what side effects, what symptoms, what treatments. So again, I try to help them see that there are potential situations where this could come in. And no, it's not just because you're going to go become a doctor or you're going to become a clinician. This is something you might, no matter what you're doing experience in your life, somebody might have a, a condition or have a situation where something occurs. So I try to do a lot more of that as well. And I also help my students scan the literature. Um, my, my upper level students tend to do this a little better as far as bringing in peer reviewed literature. I try to help my, my under, uh, sophomore or freshman students do this by actually finding the literature for them. And so like, for example, the football study I mentioned, I'll say, hey, this is research that just came out. Let, let's talk about it. What do you think? This is a big deal. I love football too, but I'm also a neuroscientist. So this was conflicting. Let's talk about it. So I think they really appreciate that. Again, I am aware of the fact that it is content heavy and I've got to just get through a certain amount, but I am trying to help them connect it to things that they can't understand that they might really experience. We can't hear you, dear. I was muted. Uh, so thank, thank you both for, for sharing that. I, I'd love to turn to a, a question we have around, um, you know, part of the uh, topic here is, you know, the overall use of, of ed tech tools, period. You've both taught thousands of students, uh, influenced and turned tens of thousands of lives. One thing I find fascinating is on both of your bios, um, Dr. Anderson Carpenter, you have a range of class sizes from 25 to 250. Uh, Dr. West, you have a range uh, between 15 and 350, everything from fully lecture to hybrid to fully online. There's this wave happening of more and more of these large lecture, these online courses. I'm curious to hear both of your vantage points, knowing the full spectrum. Um, what is it like transitioning from, say, the 15 student, you know, traditional environment to the 200 plus environment? Uh, what are some of the elements that you find are most challenging to tackle when you go to that mega scale? And, um, you know, certainly curious, you talked a little bit about it, but how you approach that. But the elements period of the situation, I'm curious um, what both of you may have reflected on in going full spectrum. So, yeah, I have taught a, a lot of different sizes and types of courses. Um, it really varies on the type of course as to what you're doing. But one of the, the consistent things is the bigger the class, the harder it is to have meaningful discussion, just because there's just so many people that you're either going to have one or two or everybody's going to be talking over everybody and it, it's hard to do. So that's one of the things that I use this Packback platform for is taking some of that discussion that could have happened in person and putting it into an online format where it's a little more equitable for everybody to participate. And then again, by highlighting the parts that I thought was good, even after the fact, I can encourage students and say this, this would have been or is a great discussion just happens to be online versus in person. Or if something is really amazing and I have a chance, you know, for example, if I am teaching a, an in-person class, I can take it back into the classroom and, and as Dr. Cass said, readjust my schedule and say, this is awesome. Didn't even think of it. We're going to talk about it. Um, so I do have some flexibility that way. Another thing that I love is that Packback gives me a glimpse about what they think is interesting because that's what they're going to ask questions about is what they find cool. Um, a very common example that comes up all the time is they want to talk about lucid dreaming. Honestly, science doesn't know a whole lot about it. I will lecture you on it, but it's going to take me all of about 15 minutes and I'm going to be exhausted. Um, and getting them to understand that it's okay that we don't know it. Let's let's talk about it a little more. And what's been neat is to see how often that comes up. And so I've actually just started mentioning it in my lecture instead of avoiding it because we don't know much. I'll just go ahead and say, we don't know much. Here's what we do know. 
Um, what do you think we could do to kind of figure out the next steps? What would you propose if you were going to be a scientist and, and study this? So it's also a nice way to kind of get a sense of what they're interested in. And that works for the 350. It also works for the 15. Um, because again, they're giving me that feedback that I can look at at any time and then decide, do I need to adjust something? Is there something more we can do? Yes. And I would just piggyback on what um, Kat said. Um, I've had, I actually made a permanent adjustment in my community psychology class based on pack back discussions. Um, in last, last year when I taught community psychology, one of the, well, I should say many of the pack back discussions around, around like mid semester, we talked about power and privilege um, and human diversity. There was a lot of engagement around that topic. And some of the points that the students brought up in class, or I should say on Packback, were points that I have never thought about. And I work with stigmatized communities. I work with marginalized populations. That's my passion. That's, that's what I specialize in. And these were points that I hadn't even thought of. So what I did actually starting this, um, this year was I completely revamped that entire lecture to incorporate some of, not some of, a lot of what they said from last year into this year. Mm -hmm. And so, and it kind of goes back to what I said earlier when, um, when I said every time I use PacMac in all my classes, I always walk away learning something new. Mm -hmm. um, I tell my students, I will learn just as much from this course as they will, if not more because I'm getting anywhere from 25 to 250 plus perspectives that may not be mm -hmm. just like mine. Mm -hmm. Great, well, thank, thank you both. And you know, we, we of course love that uh, you're both avid uh, partners of, of PackBack. You're such innovator, uh, innovative, um, you know, I'd say the deployers of, of the platform. What other technologies are you using as you take on, you know, a range of, of these challenges and, you know, what have you used maybe or around your, your usage of Packback, knowing that there's certainly, you know, in, in a lot of cases, a full suite of technologies that uh, an instructor can use uh, to take on, you know, some of the, the new age challenges um, you know, of teaching in, in the modern environment. Um, what else do you guys find are, you know, maybe working well with your, your usage of Packback? So I use Packback and Top Hat. Um, so Top Hat I use in the classroom. So I, I use it to present my lectures and students can download my lectures right from Top, uh, from top Hat and I can include check-in questions after every few slides. So basically I would lecture for 10 or 15 minutes and then they have a check-in question. But what I like is that I can put the pack back questions as discussion questions into Top Hat so they know which pack back questions we're gonna talk about. And I know a lot of students don't like to verbalize or vocalize in class for a number of reasons. Top Hat allows them to type their responses to the pack back questions that they weren't able to answer in the platform. They can do it during our full class discussion right there on the spot. And I have my TAs and I, we kind of co-monitor that. And I usually just have my TAs do it while I facilitate the discussion. And I like, I, I like the integration of Packback and Top Hat because I'm a firm believer that I have to do everything I can to make my life as stress-free as possible. I've lost enough hair. I'm not trying to lose any more. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, piggybacking on that, uh, most recently I have been teaching primarily 100% online. And one of my new favorite tools for teaching online is a piece of software called Kaltura. And what Kaltura allows me to do is to record my lecture very much like this, where the student can actually see me because I do a lot of motioning and 
pointing at my head and things when I'm talking about brain regions. And, and so it helps that the student can see me. Plus, again, if they never get to meet me face to face, they sort of get to know me and see me. And it's not just a voice speaking. And what's also nice about the Kaltura software is that periodically I can, similar to what you were just saying, stop the lecture and ask a question. So I build their chapter lectures, quizzes right into my lecture. Um, I do this several reasons. Pedagogically, it makes sense. It gives them kind of a brain break in the middle of my lectures. So they don't have to just sit for 50 minutes or an hour, however long it takes me to get through stuff. They actually, every two, three minutes, have something they have to check in and respond to. Um, it's a no pressure situation. I let them use their book. I let them use what I was just saying. I, I want them to be encouraged to get all the points possible. So again, it creates this kind of good camaraderie feeling, um, hopefully helps keep them engaged in my lecture, particularly as you get to the middle um, when everybody's fading out or want to check Facebook because they're sitting at home working on this. So I just think that's been a really neat technology. Um, I know some of my colleagues that also use Packback have been using Poll Everywhere, which is probably a similar technology to what you've been saying. Um, those are probably the biggest ones that I've been using right at the moment. Great. Well, we are right around at our, our time. Thank you both so much for joining us today. I, I would like to end with um, one last question. So um, our audience are, are, consists of many educators, um, perhaps even instructional designers. Um, what is maybe in, in you know two to three minutes, uh, the one piece of advice you would offer to a faculty member um, who's assessing a whole range of technologies, how do you approach the assessment of appropriate technologies to the teaching challenge? Um, what might be your two to three minute answer uh, to that? Maybe we'll, we'll start with you, Dr. Uh, Anderson Carpenter. Yes, I would say, um, in my experience, I think it's important to pick, choose a platform that's not only easy for you to manage, but also gives the students opportunities to really engage with the material and think critically about what they're learning. Um, and that's what I like about PacMac. I, I don't have time to read through every question. I can go through and filter and find those that have the most responses. I can then filter and find those that have the least responses and bring those to the classroom for discussion. Um, so, um, so I would say that's the most important thing. Um, find Because if, if it's not user-friendly to you as the instructor, chances are it's not going to be user-friendly for the students, and then they're just not going to use it. Oh, it's really hard to go second here because he said everything I was going to say. Um, the biggest thing for me when I'm choosing a technology is, is it user friendly to the instructor? Is it something I can grade easily? But is it also something that's going to be meaningful for my students? Are they actually going to get something out of it? Or is it just a, a reiteration of something that's already there that they already have access to? Um, so I don't like to duplicate things that they already have. Um, and that's actually been one of the biggest pushbacks that I've gotten from a number of individuals about why I use Packback versus just the discussion board on our learning management system. And I always say things like, well, it's not just a discussion board. It's got a lot of things that I can't do in the normal discussion board. I, you know, I can't give that feedback. I can't give the praising. I can't give the coaching. I can't sort, like you were just saying, for the most responded or the least responded. Um, I can't check in to see kind of overall who's been doing the most or who's been doing the least and, and spot identify a student that might need me to reach out. You know, if you saw at the beginning of the semester, a student was responding very consistently and all of a sudden drops off, they, they may need you to reach out unrelated to academic reasons. So there's a lot of good reasons why I choose tools. But again, the biggest thing is just, am I getting something out of it? Is it easy? And then more importantly, is the student getting something meaningful out of it? Especially if I'm going to ask them to pay a fee to use it, I want to make sure they're going to get something for that. Right. Well, those were, were uh, both uh, collectively great, great pieces of advice. Thank you both so much for joining us. For any audience members, if you have remaining questions that weren't able to be answered, um, please reach out. Our, our uh, question inquiry email address is simply curious at packback.co. Uh, again, the word curious at packback.co. And uh, we'll do our best to forward along the questions to Dr. Anderson Carpenter and Dr. West. So thank you both very much.